Lord, thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you. So often, Lord, you know that sometimes on Monday I go, ooh, I have to study. But Lord, I thank you that I am reminded, no, I get to study. What a blessing. It is a necessity for me. And to be quite honest, it should be a necessity for us all because the scripture, oh, it is a treasure chest. It is so deep. Um, Lord, and I thank you for the time I spend in it because it stays in my mind and my heart. It is the anchor of my soul. And you're bringing it up to me constantly to remind me, uh, you see me, you hear me, you love me. You'll never leave me. I am redeemed. And so, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be powerful here and uh, you would teach us, each individually, exactly what we need to hear. Lord, use us as the body of Christ for others. Teach us to have compassion and empathy, to see other people through the eyes of their story, to understand where they are. And help us, Lord, to know how in love to walk beside them as some of them regain their grit and press on. Lord, um, this world is in your hands. There is not one thing that has happened that has taken you by surprise. I thank you for the reminder in Daniel 4 that you literally run the kingdoms of men. And so, God, I trust you, and I seek to be very close to you so that I can hear your spirit speak to me to always know what to do, what step to take. At the end of the day, my security is in you. So, Lord, we love you, and we're excited to open the scripture with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we go. You ready? John chapter 4. I'm not even going to go back and review. Y'all know where we've been. We're going to have some review, and if you need it, go back and watch the video. It's right there, right? But we're going to hit chapter 4 full on. Here we go. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John... In parentheses, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. He left Judea, departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So Jesus leaves Judea. Remember our last chapter a little bit? You remember that uh, Jesus has started to baptize. And you remember the jealousy that kind of overcame the disciples of John? And he basically says, listen, he's the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bride. Uh, he must increase. We must decrease. And we had that whole scene. So at this point, though, so they've both been baptizing. But at this point, according to Matthew, John has now been arrested. And so Jesus knows that John has been arrested, and now it says basically that Jesus is becoming popular and well-known, and it's causing friction. And so he now leaves the area of Judea and travels to Galilee. Why? There's a phrase that we hear all the time, because his time had not yet come. So what is that telling us? Listen, he is on his father's timetable. He's on a divine schedule. It's not time to increase the conflict. It's time to increase something else. And so he moves from Judea and he heads to Galilee. Now, I find this word had in verse four very interesting. Okay, so you might want to underline it just to remember that we actually talked about this word. It's an important word. It says that, and he had to pass through Samaria. So what does that word had really mean? I mean, did he have to pass through Samaria because that was the only geographical uh, way that he could go? Mm, I don't think so. Considering the fact that, to be quite honest, any Jewish rabbi would not have gone the direct shorter route through Samaria to Galilee. Matter of fact, what would they do? They would cross over the Jordan River. They would go along the east side of the Jordan River through the area of Perea, and then they would cross back over into Galilee, avoiding Samaria completely. Um, and so, why? Why? Prejudice, 
racism. Bottom line, this is why. If you know your Jewish history, if you've been with me for a while, this will be familiar with you, right? Do you remember when I taught you all the motions? And I said, Assyria, Israel, scattered, right? So we, we had the divided kingdom. The kingdom was divided after Solomon, right? It was the United Kingdom under uh, Saul and David and Solomon, and then it divided. When it divided, you have the northern tribes, 10 tribes that are referred to as Israel, and the southern two tribes of uh, Judah and Benjamin that are referred to the land of Judah, okay? Well, the 10 tribes, or Israel, was attacked by the Assyrians, and when they were, the Assyrians scattered them all over the empire, known as the lost tribes of Israel, okay? They were scattered. Well, over the process, other foreign people moved into this area, and they intermarried with the Jews that were left behind or remained, And so, therefore, according to the Jews, what? Polluted the Jewish line, and so they were not considered true Jews. And you can imagine the hatred that came up. I mean, you're talking about a bad time for the Jews to be be scattered and killed and oppressed, and the audacity to then marry in with foreigners and to degrade the line. There was incredible hatred and racism and prejudice. And so, what I find interesting about that, and I think you should too, is what was the nation of Israel really supposed to be according to the covenant that God had with Abraham? All nations will be blessed through you. But somehow along the way, God's blessing and protection of preserving this nation, which he did, to be distinct, to be set apart, this blessing, this protection, somehow along the way turned into some kind of attitude of elitism. And it caused a prejudice and a racism to occur. Kind of like, you know, a country club, good old boys club. And so that, that's a sad situation. So at all costs, most Jewish teachers or rabbis would avoid that area altogether. They did not want to go through the area of Samaria. So back to the word had. If it's not the only geographical pathway, then what does that word actually mean? Well, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word literally means necessary. It was necessary. So what do we know? He is on a divine calendar. He is on his father's timeline. So this is telling me that in that divine calendar, there was a divine what? Appointment. It was necessary that he go through here because he had an appointment to keep. And that we're gonna see. So It says that Jesus came to a place called Sychar, to a field given to Joseph by Jacob, and which was Jacob's well. Now, here's what's going to happen, and this is going to be the hard part, and Lord have mercy, I hope I can do it well. In preparation to the story, I am about to show you So much symbolism that you're going to have floating all around. You're going to have this, you're going to have this, you're going to have this, and you're going to have this. And in the end, if I'm any good at all, which is questionable, I'm out of practice, hopefully I will bring it back together for you to make this story come alive. If I don't, you're going to have to discover it yourself through your notes, okay? But it's the setup of this scene is beautiful. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk to you about is the location of Sychar. What, where is Sychar? I'm gonna give you some Old Testament scriptures so that you understand what place it is that we're talking about. So it says Jesus went to Sychar to a field given to Joseph by Jacob in which was Jacob's well. Genesis 33, 18 through 19 are gonna give us a hint. And Jacob came safely to this city of Shechem. Okay, now this the situation is Jacob is leaving Laban. Do you remember all those years? Okay, the school of hard knocks where he accumulated basically four women 
and at this point, 11 sons, okay? And they're traveling now back to the land of Israel. And so on his way back, that's what it's saying, and Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padam Aram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamer, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent, okay? And so this land that, that we're finding out about in the Old Testament is called Shechem, Genesis 48, 22. It says, moreover, I have given to you, meaning Joseph, so Jacob has given to Joseph, rather than to your brothers, one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. The footnote for mountain slope says this, or one portion of land. It is the Hebrew word Shechem, which sounds like the town district called what? Shechem. All right? Then Joshua 2432 says, As for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money, and it became the inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. So with all of that put together, all right, our first picture or symbolism is that this place is the Old Testament place of what? Shechem. I'm going to come back to that, okay? This place was given from Jacob. It was given to who? Joseph. Okay, so here's another piece of symbolism. The word Joseph literally means he will add. You remember Joseph, right? Joseph, the one that was falsely accused and beaten by his brothers and betrayed to the Egyptian slave masters and he was put into the dungeon only to rise again to actually save his brethren. Okay? So this piece of land was given from the father to this son, which means he will add with the symbolism of all that we know about Joseph. Okay? It was given, Joseph was given this place of Shechem. Now Shechem should also ring a bell because I taught you this in Genesis. Do you remember Shechem? Shechem is a place where something historically horrific happened in the lives of the sons of Israel. If you remember, they are camped there, and Dinah, the sister, goes out unescorted, alone, because she is curious about the women of the city. And when she goes out, do you remember what happens? She is seduced by the prince of Shechem, and he takes advantage of her. Then he decides that his heart is drawn towards Dinah. We, we went all into this story in Genesis. And so he goes to ask for her hand in marriage after she's been defiled. Ask for her hand in marriage, which, I mean, you got to give it to him at that point. Her future is bleak, okay? And he asked, and if you remember, um, Jacob did nothing until the brothers came back, and then they went along with this deal that I tell you what, if, if you want to make this right, all the men of Shechem must be circumcised because that's the sign of our special covenant with our God, and if you guys will get circumcised, then we will intermarry and, and function as one people. And they bought it. And these, every male was circumcised, and then they waited three days later. Why? Because that's when you're hurting the most, because you're beginning to heal. And they went in and annihilated, murdered every male in the land of Shechem. Not only did they do that, they took all the loot, they took their children and their wives, and by the way, they went and got Dinah out of the house of the prince like she was a, an object, something to be removed. And I will tell you what, it reminds us of the status of women in biblical days. Dinah 
no rights, no power. And at this point, she has no future. And to be quite honest, no hope. Haven't you guys watched Netflix in, since we've been like sequestered to our homes? Have we not watched every historical fiction series out there, right? And every one of them, does it remind you of the status of women? They were literally raised to marry because that was the hope for any future, okay? This is the kind of scene that we're talking about. And after the story, like after the end of that story, to be quite honest, we don't really hear of Dinah again. And it's always like hurt my feelings because it's almost like her story, this hopelessness just kind of fades off the pages of scripture, never to be redeemed. And so, so far, we have the symbolism like floating around. We haven't even begun the Samaritan woman, but the introduction has already reminded us of a land with a very sordid past that left a woman very hopeless that we never really see get redeemed. It is a land that a father gave to his son Joseph, you know that son beaten by his brothers and rejected and betrayed and put in a dungeon to rise again to then go back and rescue his brethren, a son who na- whose name means he adds. And to be quite honest, that's what this scene is about. We're going to see that he is adding. So Jesus, weary from his travel, sits down at this well in Shechem the land of Jacob given to Joseph, his son. So, I'm gonna take you on a little bird walk, okay? Do you remember when I taught you about Nicodemus and I made you go back to John 2, 25? That was the chapter before Nicodemus because I told you in that chapter, John starts a thought and then he brings it into the story of Nicodemus. So if you look at John 2, 25, okay, it says he, Jesus, himself knew what was in man. Then I took you into chapter 3 and I taught you the story of Nicodemus and I showed you right, that Nicodemus didn't really ever ask Jesus a question. Do you remember this, or have we been gone too long, okay? He really didn't ever ask Jesus a question. He just said, wow, based on what you're doing, I can see that you are from God. And then Jesus turns around and says, Nicodemus, unless a man is to be born again, he will never see the king. Like, what? That is because he knew what was in man, And there was a question, the whole purpose that Nicodemus came is he has a question in his gut. Will I see the kingdom? And Jesus answers the question. So something he introduced in chapter two, we see coming, playing out in this beautiful narrative that John is writing in three. Well, we're gonna see the same thing here because I want you to be reminded of what he said in John three, the chapter before this one, John 3, 28 through 30. It says this. You yourself bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the what? Is the bridegroom. And he goes on to say, listen, I'm just a friend of the bride. So he brings up, we find out before this chapter that John is referring to Jesus as the bridegroom, okay? You're like, who cares? Well, you will see. (laughs) Okay, so let me put all this together so far for you. I know, it's all like, "Ah." Shechem brings up the idea of who? Dinah, hopelessness, fades off the pages of scripture. We had the idea of a father giving his son Joseph, which means he will add, okay, this well. We then have the chapter before, John the Baptist refers to Jesus as the bridegroom. Why does that matter? Because let me teach you something about wells, okay? What is the significance that he set down at this well? Well, number one, 
Obviously, a well was the place where young women went to what? Draw water, all right? And although the primary function was to draw water for the home because of the central location of the well, I mean, the civilization was built around water, okay? That's why they were there. It became this gathering place, right? That's why you see so many like churches or Christian organizations, they make coffee shops called what? The well, okay? This gathering place. And travelers would even stop at wells along the way to water their flocks, right? I mean, how do you think gossip got around, <laughs> right? All the travelers would come to the well. Who's there? The women of the village. They just found, they just got the 411. And they now spread it out, okay, in their village of what is happening around. I mean, come on, that's how the word got out. So it also, wells also served as landmarks. So when you arrived at a well, you really realized where you were, okay? But wells were also the place of betrothal scenes. You're like, ding, 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 ding. I'm starting to get where she's going. Are you there? Is anybody starting to get where I'm going? Okay, so he was referred to as what in the chapter before? Okay, and he sits down at a well. And so these scenes are gonna be familiar. So basically, young women came out together. Why together? Safety in numbers, escorted, okay. They came out together to draw water. Where there are young women, there is the attention of what? Men, okay? So men realized that this was their opportunity to in some way socialize with women away from the watchful eye of their fathers and their brothers. The Bible gives several examples of women meeting their future husbands at wells. You remember some of them? Okay, Abraham finally wakes up one day after Sarah dies and realizes he's not gonna live forever and he's like, oh darn, you know, uh, Isaac is supposed to be the father of this great nation. He doesn't even have a wife yet. Uh, I might need to get on the stick and do something about that. So he sends Eliezer back to Padan Aram, right? And Eliezer, the, his right-hand man, ends up finding Rebecca where? At a well, okay? Then we have, if you remember when Jacob was running for his life, he goes back to that area, and at a well, he meets... Rachel. We even have this scene of how Moses met who? You remember his wife's name from the Prince of Egypt movie? That'll help you. Sephora, okay, at the well. So there's kind of a pattern that happens in these narratives. You have a man travels from a foreign land where he meets a young woman at a well and she draws water for him. And after meeting with the girl's family, they arrange a marriage, okay? So we have all of this symbolism that is happening. So here you have a bridegroom, right? His name, uh, that, that well was given to Joseph, whose name means he adds. And here he is, sits down, and he's about to meet a woman coming out to draw water. Okay, I'm just setting up the scene. We haven't even gotten to the story yet, all right? But I want to set this scene up for you. Another thing that wells are known for is it's a place for divine revelation. If you remember when Sarah booted Hagar, it was at a spring or this well, this water source that God appeared to her and said, what? I've heard you. And he blesses uh, Ishmael. Okay, he, he blesses him to be a numerous people, a strong people. And so you have all of these attributes of a well. So, as I read this scene, I, had all, I wanted to give you all the images that were in my head. And you're like, please stop doing that because I'm so confused, <laughs> okay? But if you know the Old Testament, do you remember I say that they mention things in the New Testament? And if you don't know the story, you're not going to get the beauty of the overall picture. You do this with your friends, right? You have friends that you can say one word. You don't have to tell the whole story because they know the story. And the minute you say that word, they're already understanding what you're talking about. Well, we aren't the friends, so we have to be reminded. So before I even started the story, I have all these things in my head. Joseph, he will add. 
Shechem, Dinah, a woman leaves the pages of scripture hopeless and victimized. A well where many betrothals occur. John the Baptist calling Jesus the bridegroom in the chapter before. Not to mention the necessity of the trip, that it was a divine appointment. Would this visit to the well bring some kind of divine revelation? Isn't that cool? Now, let's answer all that. Now, let's get into the scene. But I find that so helpful for the richness of this story, okay? Verse seven. Are y'all bored? Okay, good. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. One thing that has always been highlighted about this woman is the fact that she came to draw water at noon, the heat of the day. Our assumption is that she is avoiding the judgmental glances from the upright women who drew water earlier in the day. Although, to be quite honest, there is no historical evidence that there was any certain time of day that women went out to draw water, but we assume, based on heat, that they would have gone earlier. And to be quite honest, our assumption, or should I say our judgment, because of this, has been to label this woman a bad girl. Because we know that she's been married five times and she is now living with someone. So our modern bias and judgment as we read that scripture has labeled her a bad girl. Why? Strictly from the information that she came at noon and from the information we get later that she was married five times and lives with someone. And I know you've probably been taught that way. And the minute we have that bias, we read the rest of this story with that bias. So I'm going to kind of turn it on its head a little bit, okay? What if our judgments are wrong? Or what if our judgments have gone way, way too far? Could there be cultural reasons for her situation? And are we putting her in a modern day light where she had rights that she actually did not have? Okay, I'm just throwing that out there for you. Let me give you some examples. Could she have been widowed? Well, we know that Naomi lost her husband and her two sons in a very short period of time. So could she have been widowed? Yeah. And life expectancy in biblical times was incredibly short. And because women needed protection and they needed support, most widows did what immediately? Remarried. Okay? So there's some option. Could she have been divorced? Well, think about this. If she was barren... I can think of several discontented men who would have divorced her and cast her aside, which just goes to show you how much uh, Elkanah loved Hannah, right? He loved her. He did not cast her aside. I mean, you have situations all through Scripture where we can see this. Um, But what we also need to understand is that Jewish law, in general, reserved the right to divorce to the husband, According to biblical law, a man is permitted to divorce his wife at will and send her away from his home. The second aspect highlights biblical women's vulnerability, economic, physically, and psychological uprooting faced the woman who displeased her husband sufficiently to cause him to divorce her. She had no leverage to prevent or refuse the divorce. Neither could she divorce him. Another uh, commentary, many have assumed she filed for divorce five times when actually among the handful of Greek and Aramaic Jewish divorce documents, we have only one that seems to be initiated by a wife and she needed a male representative to help her. So far more likely that the men divorced her. Okay, 
Was she widowed? Did she, was she barren? Why did she go through the divorces? We don't know. But I will say it puts a little bit different slant when you have this information. Then you get to the place where she's basically a live-in. Are you kidding me? We don't have enough sense to understand that in her culture. My gosh, we kind of justify it in ours, right? The woman has been cast aside for whatever reason, and I'm not saying that she did not have fault. I'm not, because we all know what in life. Two-way street, baby, we all have fault. You think I look back in my life and think it, what, none of it was my fault? Uh, no, I've been in therapy for four years. Are you kidding me? Okay, that's not gonna happen. So I'm not erasing fault that she had no fault, but I'm telling you, she did not have the right, the power, the security that very often from a very male perspective, this story is taught. Not happening. So now she's been discarded and in danger and alone, whatever, five times in this world culture that she lives in. And now we can kind of understand why she settles for a situation to just live with a man who provides, who watches over, a place to go, a place to put her head. You, you know what I'm saying. I mean, and don't act like we don't settle for those situations in our world today too. Sometimes when you hear a story, right? <laughs> not, that, not that it's right, but you understand why two older people who've been through whatever and have their own lives and their own kids and whatever fan financial situations. I mean, you can at least empathize with the situation as to why they've just resided to have a partnership for life. You get my drift? Without such judgment. Once again, I'm not preaching right and wrong. I'm talking about understanding someone's story, having empathy, having a different perspective. And this is the situation. What hurts me about it is when you look at it from that situation, you, wonderful, you wonder if thousands of years later, we are continuing to victimize the victim when we teach this story. If a man came to draw water alone, would we have jumped to such conclusions? Why do we immediately jump to judgment instead of sympathy? The fact is, she comes alone, that should bring sympathy because it tells me she is vulnerable, she is unprotected, maybe completely undervalued, and she comes to the well. Let me tell you two other things that used to bug me about this story. If she was such the bad girl that she came to avoid all of the judgment from all the other pious women because of all that she had done, I'm just wondering why on earth the whole town bought her testimony right off the bat, lickety split, when she came talking about Jesus. Another thing that I've always wondered is unlike the adulterous woman, Jesus never looks at her at any time in this story and says anything like, woman, go and sin no more. So, with that in mind, whatever perspective you hold, it doesn't change the, the really overarching story of Jesus and this woman, but I'm gonna tell you what, it does give us a little bit different slant to read the story. So in my notes, <laughs> I wrote, I'm not telling you what to believe, but I would encourage you to read this scripture without the filter of your traditions and truly view it in the light of biblical culture. So what if noon literally just represented light of day or public or out in the open? What if it represented the opposite of Nicodemus coming at night? The one who had the light of scripture but remained in spiritual what? Darkness. Yet here we have someone living in darkness walking into the light of revelation. Well, moving on with the story. Jesus initiated the conversation. He opened the way for relationship. Here's Shannon Hoffpower version <laughs> of what is in her mind. Wow, I can't imagine what she was thinking. Had she tensed up the moment she saw a male figure at the well? Was she used to minding her own business, 
acting invisible, putting her head down and getting the job done, you know, remaining silent. I am sure she had maneuvered many situations like this before. She was a survivor. For some reason, I really like looking at this woman in the light of kind of a strength, more than victimizing her to just label her the bad girl, all right? It was, no, it was a scary thing being a woman in these days. Now, this man speaks to her. I imagine many men had spoken to her, don't you? Maybe at one point she had hopes and dreams of what the fir- her first encounter and conversation would be like, and maybe it was. But those days of innocence are long gone. The reality of men, in their words, no longer gave her hope. And to be quite honest, shock. Until now. Now she's surprised. Why? Because this man is a Jew. Not only did Jews hate Samaritans, but Jewish men didn't speak openly to women in public. And by the way, Jewish rabbis didn't even speak to their own wives in public. They would definitely not have had a public conversation in the light of day with a Samaritan woman. Yet, here Jesus did. Why would he start this? Con- I just think, she's like, why would he start this conversation? What does he want? What are his intentions? This is a well, remember? Well, she doesn't really know. But she sure seems to avoid any conversation. Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Done. Right? I mean, I could have closed the door. She in no way opened the door for continual conversation. I don't know why you're speaking to me. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. (laughs) If only you knew who was talking to you right now. If you did, you would be, be pursuing a conversation with me and the hope I would give you would be like living water. Well, for the Jewish people, living water, like in the physical, in the earthly, It literally just meant flowing, moving, not stagnant, stagnant, fresh water. But I will say this. The Jewish people did did actually have this in the spiritual sense in their scripture. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 13 says this. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. For they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. So there is context. Matter of fact, Jesus speaks of it in John 7, 38, where he said, whosoever believes in me, the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He's quoting the Old Testament. And so there is context, but the fact is, she is receiving it how? Earthly, okay? The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So Jesus is speaking spiritually, but she is hearing physically, literally. No different than Nicodemus. So let's not judge this woman so harshly. Right? Let's remember that conversation too. What did he say when Jesus started speaking spiritually and he was hearing physically or literally? He said this. How can a man be born when he is old? Do I jump back in my mother's womb? So she says, how are you going to get this fresh flowing water that feeds this well? This well is deep, and man, it was. Today, the well of Jacob in that location is, they believe, to be about still 75 feet deep. 
This is a place where the water flows down off the mountains. It's limestone, it's porous, so the water seeps deep into the earth, and that's why you have these deep wells. But in this modern day, of, you know, 75 feet deep, can you imagine over all of these years the debris that has fallen in that well? Not to mention that along these uh, decades, structures have been built and knocked down and built over Jacob's well. All right, so this was a really deep well. And she's like, where are you gonna get this living water? You gonna dig a new well? Really? Are you greater than Jacob who actually found this source, dug this source, and created a well that not only he could drink from, but still today it has lasted that we're drinking from it. And you're gonna do this, and I don't see one tool in your hand. How are you gonna do this? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is so similar to what we see with Nicodemus. Because with Nicodemus, he was talking about what? Being born again, new birth. And he's like, Nicodemus. Physical can only what? Birth physical. Spiritual has to be there to birth spiritual. And so he, he is talking in the same way. Basically, he's, he's talking about Ecclesiastes. What is the book of Ecclesiastes about? Well, I'm about to write about it just in case you wanna know. Ecclesiastes is talking about the fact that Everything the world has to, if, if you take God out of the scenario, everything the world has to offer you is smoke. You see it, and when you go to grab it, what? It's emptiness. And this is what, this is what he's telling her. So he's saying, the water I give you will never run out because the fountain is in you. We understand this concept in the light of scripture, you know. Christ in us, the hope of glory, we think that is, it's marvelous. But to her, it was total what? Mystery. So the woman says, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Listen, she doesn't truly understand, but what? She longs. Somewhere deep inside, she still believes there is, there has to be more. Somewhere deep inside, eternity still resides in her heart. You do realize that's what that scripture means, that God placed eternity in the hearts of men. There's something that drives us that we know this cannot be it. There has to be something more. It seems like she's at the same place that Nicodemus was at in John 3, 9. When he's explaining the wind, he's been trying to go deep with Nicodemus. And he too, he's longing. But what does he say in John 3, 9? How can these things be? With Nicodemus, Jesus goes deeper by giving him an Old Testament story. Remember that? the bronze serpent. He gives him that story so that he can begin to understand. Nicodemus, I understand you're the best that a Jewish man has to offer, but I am telling you, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom. Why, Nicodemus? Because in order to do that, it has to be given to you. It has to be by faith. You know, the bronze serpent, the very thing that was killing them, Jesus, who had no sin, became sin. How will you have it, Nicodemus? You have to look and live. He went deeper with him through an Old Testament story. Well, he's not going to do that with a Samaritan woman. So instead of using an Old Testament story, guess what he does? He uses hers. He uses her story. So Jesus says, okay, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. She didn't lie. I have no husband. Do you feel like it was her obligation to tell her whole story? 
I swear, when I used to read this, I was like, she's hiding something. Really? Do you first meet a preacher and say, oh, by the way, well, I did this in high school and this in college, and matter of fact, I am divorced. Yeah, I'm a Bible teacher, but I'm divorced, and my, you know, our family, the wheels came off for a real long time, had to kick my daughter out of the house, now she loves me, we're all good, and then I lost my son, and let me tell you what else is going on in my life. I had freaking COVID, I lost my mind here. I mean, do you do that? <laughs> I don't, right? I mean, come on. At this point, we're getting to know one another, and she made a true statement. I have no husband. Then he says, what? You are right in saying I have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Her life has been a parable of what he's describing. Her life had not turned out the way she hoped. And at the end of the day, she was broken and hopeless, and she was always forced to continue to go back to that same darn well that never seemed to satisfy Not to mention the fact that Jesus tells her all of that to make her truly understand, listen, I'm no normal man making you an offer for just another relationship. You need to understand who it is that's talking to you, and we're getting there. So the woman said to him, sir, I now perceive that you are a prophet. She now understands that he's a prophet, a man of God, having supernatural knowledge. So now, now she begins to ask. Now she begins to feel safe. Why? Because she realizes that this man knew all of that beforehand and sat down with her anyway. She knows that he already knew her brokenness. He already knew about the skeletons. She's not innocent. He already knew all of this and he sat down with her and he is the one who initiated relationship with her. I, if I were her, I'd be like, how did this happen? Could this have been chance? Coincidence? I can't help but hear the echoes of Hagar. Mm, the God who hears can't help but hear the echoes of Leah where she says, now God has seen my pain. I can't help but think about Dinah. Maybe she wasn't forgotten. Could it be that all along God did see their hearts and their conditions and he did care? So she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem, that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You Jews say. Some people, if they teach it from the previous slant, say that the woman is going off on some bird walk trying to avoid the issue of her five husbands. I do not think that. I think she's sincere. I think she finally is grasping that she is talking to someone very special with supernatural knowledge, a prophet of God who's accepted her to sit down to talk to her. And for once, she has an ear and she has a question. And she is like, okay, tell me what to do. And isn't that always our first question? What can I do, right? I believe her question is sincere. What must I do? Well, her scenario is this. She says, I'm utterly confused because you Jews say that we got to travel to Jerusalem and worship at the temple. But the Samaritans, well, because of, you know, the friction and all of that, we've created our own at the top of our own mountain. And we're supposed to go, actually, we believe this is the mountain that Abraham sacrificed Isaac on. And so we come up to our mountain. I literally, I, I don't know what to do. I really don't know what to do. You know what I thought about as I, this is definite sidetrack. Um, you know what I thought about when I was reading this? Because believe it or not, you know, you read the scripture and God just applies things to your life in the current situation and you're just going, oh my gosh. And I wrote in my notes here, I go, man, can I see an example of this in our world today, especially with politics? No reliable source of news. 
One side seems to be about control and censorship, while the other side seems to be about conspiracy and a call to action that leads to nowhere. And then I think, well, it happens in the churches too along the way. Seekers get and they hear one thing here and they hear another thing here and this is how, and at the end of the day, you're just sitting there going, oh my gosh, I don't know. What do I do? So she basically gives Jesus the scenarios of what she's been taught or heard all along, and she literally doesn't know what to believe. So Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Jesus is telling her, ooh, Jesus is telling her that there is coming a time when neither will matter. Because to be quite honest, neither has led to life. And he says, you worship what you do not know. We Jews worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Doesn't this right here summarize our last two stories, to be quite honest? Nicodemus, who had knowledge of God as a Jew, because God had given him the revelations of the scripture, as a covenant people, salvation would come through them. So Nicodemus had all the revelation. We worship what we know, but still what? He ended up in spiritual darkness. And then again, you have this woman over here who has really not very much revelation, no knowledge. You're worshiping what you do not know. She has a desire, but is in darkness. And now she's meeting Jesus and she's coming into the light. He says, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. He's like, listen, don't you worry about it, my daughter. <laughs> Things are about to change. Things are about to change. There will no longer be distinction. There will no longer be two groups. There is going to be one bride, neither Greek nor Jew, male nor female, free or slave. No, I am bringing it together. Yes, there was a stump, okay? There is a tree, but you will be grafted in. It is one body of Christ, one group of worshipers. And how will it happen? Because you will be born again. You will be made alive. The spirit of God will be in you that will be a fountain of living water. See, you will become the temple of God. You will have intimate knowledge, firsthand knowledge and relationship with God. I got to thinking about this. I went back to my little political example when I was writing in my own journal. And I thought, you know what, Shannon? How much time are you wasting, like, watching the news or searching the deep, dark web when you have firsthand relationship with the one who rules the world? So how about you spend less time with nonsense and more time leaning in and listening to the Spirit so if the Spirit gives you instruction, no matter what the culture or the atmosphere of our world you hear it and you obey it. And what he's saying too here in religion is don't worry about all the instructions. I'm going to instruct you. I will speak into you. We will have a personal relationship. You will worship me in spirit and in truth. Are you spending more time watching the news or surfing the web or communicating with the Father? Last verse. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. You want to talk about a divine revelation at a well? That's the, he looked at her and said, I am. So what does that mean? He will tell us all things. In this story, He's pretty much told us all things. He's pretty much told us all we need to know in this relationship. I'm out of time, so I'm just gonna read to you my concluding paragraph. 
in the land of Shechem, where Dinah's hopes were lost, and her story just seemed to fade from the pages of Scripture unredeemed. Here is a story in the same land concerning another woman whose hopes seemed to also be hanging on by a thread. Yet the bridegroom comes to meet her at the well, knowing everything about her, and he offers her relationship, hope, and a new life. This life will not be found in earthly exterior things and relationships, but in Jesus. He is the fountain of living water in our hearts. We see a beautiful connection. He will bring the Jew, the best representative there. Listen, you will not get there by works. You must be born again. And he will bring the Gentile and a woman. The marriage, the, oh, the bride of Christ, she represented the bride of Christ broken, alone, doing her best, wandering around in the dang darkness, trying to just live by sheer conscience. And he brings them together. Why? He adds. He is adding. The bridegroom is forming his bride. And it will be neither Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. It, this right here... I could honestly study it so many more times and get something out of it. But I hope I've painted it for you in a different way, a new way, um, I think in a way that fits the overall narrative of Scripture. And so study that this week. It is the most beautiful story of the bridegroom waiting for his bride who's been broken, who's lost hope. Why? Because the world's beat the crud out of her. And she sits down and he initiates conversation. And he gently leads her. Not condemning. He leads her into a deep conversation where she understands who he is. And that he wants a relationship. And that he wants to come in and be a spring of living water that bubbles up in her soul. And that she does not have to depend on outside sources. Because the father She's the bride of Christ. He will speak to her. They will have a relationship. Beautiful reminder. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today. I thank you for your scripture. Lord, I pray that you would continue to allow us to meditate on this story and maybe even tie up loose ends and put things in order for us, um, apply it to our lives personally. Lord, may we be more like Jesus. May we be. May we come to those who are confused and hurting and hopeless and don't understand and just literally sit with them to realize the planks in our eye so that we can help get the speck out of the others. I mean, really have empathy and compassion, communication, and bring one another along to a relationship with Jesus. Lord, I thank you so much that I have the privilege of teaching your word. Sometimes, Lord, I get lost in the responsibility of it, but Lord, I thank you. It's a gift and a blessing to me. In Jesus' name, amen.